Hey, welcome everybody and to another online platform for today's leadership panel uh, on empowerment and engagement. And I'm delighted to have a fantastic smiley panelists today from Eddie McGillicuddy from Glen Carr, James Connell of Oliver Connell, Sam Mullins from Fireward and Dunmore Group, Jacqueline O'Donovan uh, from O'Donovan Waste and Dermot O'Grady from Arden Tide. And today we have our moderator of moderators, uh, which is Anita Brightly Hodges from Family Business Space. Um, Anita has a fantastic experience um, in, in this industry, of course, 25 years in branding and in internal communications with um, Sony and Ericsson. So without any further ado, I will hand you over to our moderator, Anita. Welcome. And we're going to have 40 minutes or so of um, some wisdom, some shared wisdom, um, some, some nuggets from our panelists who have very graciously given up their time. I like the fact that we've got a mixed bunch of um, services here from infrastructure to, bu to building construction um, uh, to uh, payroll and um, fire. Um, and so it's, it's quite nice to have that and, um, and also waste disposal. So we've got a nice spread. I think that's, that's fantastic. Before we start, I'm going to give everybody a reading list. So if you've got your pens, because this is going to, you'll see how this is going to be important as we go through the session. So on my list of must read stuff, um, the first one is Competing for Talent, Becoming an Employer of Choice by Nancy Alec. Okay, a fantastic book. That's my Bible for employee engagement. And we know that becoming an employer of choice is the number one thing given we're in the situation that we are at the moment. The second book is Work Like a Woman by Mary Portis. Okay, because times they are changing, you know, and the girls are coming up. And you guys need to know what that means to those girls so that you can tap into their excellence and expertise, their empathy, and their sort of all round fabulousness, really. Um, <laughs> The next one is interesting. It's called Turn the Ship Around. I don't know if anyone's read that book. It's about turning followers into leaders. And it's quite apt because we're talking about empowerment today. And that's by David Marquette. It's a true life story about, um, uh, a, a, about a, a naval officer who um, turned his, you know, a failing ship, a, you know, they were just failing in the fleet, turned the whole thing around, but by having to change his way of doing things. And um, it's an excellent book, it's great. Um, the fourth one is called Let It Go by Dame Stephanie Shirley. Now, most, um, most of the construction industry have roots in Irishness, okay? Dame Stephanie is not Irish, but she came to the UK on the kinder train bef um, just before World War II. And if you don't know who she is, uh, look her up. A couple of things really, because she came as a refugee, was adopted, then built this amazing business that floated. And um, I think it's called Zanza at the end. She became a dame and she only now um, gives money to, um, uh, with regard to philanthropy. One, uh, she supports anything, any innovation to do with um, technology and the other with autism because she grew up with an autistic child in those days. An amazing woman. And she has a great TED talk called Why Women Have Flat Heads. It's worth checking that out. And then the fifth book, Why Brands with Purpose Do Better and Matter More by David Hyatt. Okay, because now more than ever, your brand is going to change and evolve like it has never done before. Okay, let's begin then. So the theme of today is about empowerment. Um, we're talking about what does empowerment look like in our organizations? Um, and given that we'd like to think that all our staff are empowered, what's happened with COVID-19 has really demonstrated whether or not we've got it right. Okay, because for those of us that have got it right, there's a different story to those of us that got it wrong. But there's no, there's no, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way things are. And the world is never going to be the same again. It's going to be changed forever. So we need to be open-minded. So what I really value in the panelists today is they're going to give us really their side of how they've dealt with COVID-19, um, their approach to um, empowerment. What does that really mean? Uh, as opposed to engagement. 
Um, and then in my reckoning, there are three stratas. One is senior management. How are they empowered in your organization? Middle management, it's a toughy in middle management, okay? And then those at the cold face, okay? They're the ones that are actually delivering, doing the doing, okay? They need to be as empowered. And um, so I think without, let, let's just move on. I, my first guest, really, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to welcome Eddie McGillicuddy. That was a mouthful. Smile, you're on camera. Right. Um, so, Eddie, how did you, you know, you, you have quite an interesting business model. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think that is key to how you've dealt with the whole notion sure. of empowerment because it's essential to your, your business. Yeah, it's absolutely. Right. It's, it's fundamental to our business. Glencar, we're a management contractor, so we don't have anyone actually on the tools on the front line. We're a management only contractor. So empowerment is fundamentally part of the culture of the organization because everyone from has to make decisions on the day-to-day -day basis and COVID, if nothing else has thrown that up even more, the guys on the front line are, are having to react to all new situations and make decisions at any given time. Fantastic. So can you, um, when this all happened, what was the, what was your response? Did you act as quickly as you'd like to have acted? Would there be um, done differently? And how did you, um, how did how did the needs of the business going forward and the staff and the employees, how did it manifest itself and what structures did you put in place to to take all those things on? Well, the, the immediate reaction was to think about the team members. We have to keep everyone safe. We have to keep, and not just our, us, the management and the teams outside, also our subcontractors, which out on our sites will be in excess of a thousand individuals. That was the first thing. So how can we keep people safe and how can we, maintain the service we're giving to our customers. Ultimately, we're building some significant schemes for people like Accard or Aberdeen Standard Investments. These guys want to see progress on their schemes, but not at the cost of the health of the employees. Um, we shut down the two central London schemes because we couldn't separate people, the sort of social distancing. We had to shut them down while we paused and took stock of the situation. Some of the larger industrial units we're building, we could maintain social distancing by bringing in additional welfare, bringing in additional sort of drying rooms, we brought in additional labour to ensure people were adhering to social distancing. We brought in additional sanitising procedures, so on and so forth. So we've acted straight away. Do we, will it, is there lessons learned? There's bound to be, but I think we're still in the throes of this. I don't think we're through it. So I don't think we can look back on lessons learned just yet. I think at the end of it, we'll take stock. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Um, and um, we talked um, previously about with empowerment comes risk. And um, it's all very well saying our staff are empowered, but what does that really mean? And are you the sort of leader that is okay with taking risk? What does that mean to you? What does it mean to your staff? And if, some, if there's a muck up moment, how would you react to that? Because with risk sure. comes, well, you know, so perhaps tell us a little bit about that. That'd be fantastic. Sure. I think empowerment actually starts at the interview stage, doesn't it? Because it's at that moment you're having belief in someone and you're taking a risk on them. They're coming into your organisation. They're going to take, make decisions the day, the day they start on you. So the fact that literally our graduate trainees come in and they make decisions straight away. So we are fundamentally an empowered organisation. Do we take risks? You are taking risks fundamentally by employing people. You have to believe in them. You have to empower them. And with that comes the element of risk. They will make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Take the learning acknowledge it and let's not make that happen again um we talked also about the ratio of women to men in construction and now we have a, a whole new brave world now um and uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's your approach to that and, and and because because of covid um 19 i think everyone is just reviewing their own lives now and they're just thinking do you know what there's bad stuff that's happened it's really bad stuff but I have had an opportunity to really think about my life and what I want that to mean to me and my family. Yeah. So, um, and we talked a little bit about, you know, having a chief emotional officer, but sort of a full time <laughs> person on the team, because this is COVID. The next thing that's happened could be something else and we don't want to be caught short again. So had you had some thoughts on that? Yes, we, um, one thing we are going to do is like a, a critical event plan so in the event of this we have a plan that, in, that we instigate you're going to review that like almost every two months really because you couldn't plan for this we didn't plan for it we're a four-year-old business we don't have these sort of plans in place just yet we're evolving these sort of elements 
that's a big learning I'll take out of this is have that plan in place. You mentioned females in construction. We, we don't discriminate any way, shape or form. It's the best person for the job. We have about 15 out of 90 people. We employ 90, so I'll say about 15 a female. It's the best person for the job. There's no uh, discrimination associated at all. We're in construction. I get it. No, I get it. So, okay. So, um, what advice would you give to somebody? Because you have a brilliant um, business formula. This sort of um, a, a sort of autonomy within the products you have, which means you have small yeah. teams that are very, very, you know, they're very, very sort of hands-on and client-friendly and know what's going on, etc. And you give and you empower them, which is amazing. And you know, four years, you built up a forty million pound turnover of business. You're doing something right. How amazing is that? What, what, you know, what advice would you give to somebody? Because there are people that don't like to let go. They don't like to. They don't you have want to trust. To you have to trust your people. You have to identify, employ, and retain those people. So engagement is a massive one. Making sure people want to come to work. They want to make the decisions. They want to put their hands up when things are things to be done. So I'd definitely think it's people. People. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've grown quickly, and the only way we've been allowed to grow is people. And yeah. allowing them to take that autonomy out on site. We run our sites completely autonomous. There's no central buying. There's no central procurement. The guys out on site make the, the decisions. So they feel that and by that virtue of that, they should engage. What's the job? Oh, so where she is. So let's do seven minutes. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you, thank you so much, Eddie. And I'm sure there'll be questions that people ask about your sure. formula and why why you've been so successful. And I think it's a really fantastic way to start to start off the um the um the session. So thank you for that. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my next guest is James Connell, MD of Oliver Connell and Son. Hello there, James. How, How are you? you? Hi, Hello, everybody. Good, good. And um, what was so interesting for me talking to you? Yeah. Um, you're second generation. That's right. So you already know there's a particular way that um, your dad, is he there? No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then well, yeah. um, that your dad and not just, but his generation ran their businesses. You yeah. know, can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Because there'll be people here, uh, um, of, you know, the first generation in their late 50s, perhaps 60s, yeah. and it will be very, very familiar for them to hear this. It was, um, it was quite tough working underneath them, to be honest with you. You know, they were very hard, but give you a very good work ethic. And um, construction industry, when I started 22, 23 years ago, was, you know, it was a lot of barking, a lot of shouting, um, no such thing as empowerment. It was more just get the job done. And, you know, um, I think it's evolved and our business has evolved over, over the years. But yeah. And for me, as being a son, it was, um, you know, you always had to do a bit more. You know, Dad never, would never like to see that he was giving me any favouritism. So I always got the, always got the crap jobs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you've taken the best of your dad's way of doing things and you've added your own. So tell yeah. us a little bit about what that means to you, because you're going to, have, you know, it's just in your nature now to empower more people and have... You know, you're not your dad. You're not the entrepreneur. Uh, you know, we probably have. What's your style? We probably have 30. You know, we've grown, I suppose, over the. We, we've done 100 million last year and in 2010, 3 million. So, you know, we before you'd have, we'd have much more sort of hands on with the guys on the tools and that. And as, as the business has grown, I wouldn't see so much of it. So I have to delegate a lot of the stuff I used to do and trust people. As Eddie said, you know, I have to trust people with the trust people with the baby, really, and, and delegate my duties, and and that's empowerment for them. And then, you know, they will have they'll recognise talent in people, and they'll empower them, and it goes right the way down the line. But you know, Sam said something yesterday, and I thought it was very good. You know, you can dance someone to sweep the yard one way or another way. You know, one way saying you're doing a good you know a job, and it needs to be done. Or, you could just go out and tell him sweep the yard. And I thought that was a good analogy of, of you know, how, um, how you should be talking to people, you know, no matter what level they are in the business. I mean, when I walk on the site, because I've been on the site, you know, and I've drove machines and laid concrete and, you know, I have a good relationship with the guys. They know, you know, I know what I'm talking about and I'm not, you know, sat in a 
a big chair in the office just you know and and don't have that experience and you know we we give them all the time of day and i think you get more a lot more out of them like that you know but they're finding it tough obviously at the minute you know we've had to make cuts to you know to 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 adopt to the situation that's going on around us we spoke yesterday we're in a lot of sectors my heathrow airport business has just gone you know um I've got no work there, but I've got other areas, sectors that I'm increasing and, and winning work. So you've got to adopt in this uh, climate, you know, and see, you know, recessions, they're not bad for everybody. You know, if you can adopt and, you know, there'll be, we'll say there'll possibly be more social housing, less developers building homes, you know, so we'll be looking to sort of push that side of the business. But um, it's hard at the minute with the guys. I mean, you're, you're, we are doing cuts and productivity on site is going down at the same time we're trying to get a bit more out of them you know but it's um it's it's tough uh, climate and you have to do things to survive you know and i think the guys we're lucky in the construction industry you know there's we, i've had conversations with guys on site and, and explained to them look you know there's people at home with no work you look at the hospitality restaurants pubs you know there's there's no construction is still sort of going you know we've slowed down a bit and productivity slowed down a bit but you know it's all for the good to keep people safe and that and you know they they understand that it's a it's a matter of um, thank you. You know, thank adopting you. Thank you for that. I have a question for you, actually, because you're such a large organisation, and I'd just like to reflect a little bit on, on mental health, if I may. Yes. So um, we know that um, uh, the construction industry um, has the highest rate of suicides. It's a very difficult space to work in. Yeah. Um, and there are many, many things that can that can contribute to mental health. It could be financial. It can be hating your job. It could be outside you know influences from outside of the work that you do yeah but it's there so um and it's been quite topical recently so can you tell us a little bit about um, what you have in place because empowerment we know that empowerment if it's really coming from the heart and it's the root of the um the organization it doesn't yeah. look like something and it has a huge benefit to your persona yeah confidence what structures have you put in place that um, where you've addressed those things? Well, a lot of our workforce are sort of migrating. You know, as the six, seven hundred guys we'd have, we'd have maybe two or three hundred that are with, with us regularly. Now, occasionally we'll have instances, you know, where we can recognise there's problems. You know, and as recently as last year, we helped people out with some addiction problems, and you know, they came personally straight to me, and we put them in the right direction and he's and even contributed to helping them going away to, to fix themselves in that instance it's in front of your face but a lot of it we we don't see the construction industry especially our game ground workers and concrete guys they're not the sort to come forward we've got mental health health first aiders we've got comment boxes on sites you know for our regular lads that I know, on a two or three occasions, I've spotted it and you can go and talk to them and you, you know, you'll, you'll know them and you'll know something's up. And on a few occasions, it's, it's, it's worked. And, you know, the same with the guys below me, you know, in the chain of command, they've done that as well with people we, we know regularly. But it's still very difficult. I mean, a lot of our guys would be from Eastern Europe, you know, I said to you that to yesterday. And they would be even a bit more sort of, how would you say it, a bit more, you know, slow in coming forward with mental health issues you know they might they might see themselves or in their community or in their gang or in the the, the, the site as weak i don't know you just it's hard it's it, it is hard but we you know where we can see it where we have seen it we have tried to help people and we have helped people on occasions and there is people there like mental health first staters we've got a few of them and we've got comment boxes and people can come forward but i would say there's a lot of guys out there with problems that I don't know about. So um, a lovely friend of ours is um, Sir John Timpson. Have you heard of him? No. Sir John Timpson. So when you get your shoes mended, the Timpsons. Yeah. Right? Yeah? yeah. Yeah. So, um, and the reason I think it's really important mental health is because you can turn that on its head. Mm -hmm. So he has a particular thing where as part of his workforce, he goes into prisons and you can imagine they are, people with seriously bad mental health issues. Yeah. But has found a way to get them out of that trap, and that's through work, yeah. but it's a deliberate strategy to 
give them confidence and empower them to such an extent. You go to John Tinson shoe shop and each member, uh, each person that's looking after that has the power to negotiate to the tune of 500 quid on anything. Yeah. Right, so you could be an ex-con, you could be difficult. Time, okay. I tell you, I'm not, I'm not joking, but it doesn't happen on its own. That's what I'm saying. He has a particular yeah. structure, so it might be worth looking at his structure. It's called the Upside Down Management. Yeah. Okay, and um, and he's opening up a university at the moment for management, but he's really taken that that huge um, that huge cohort of people that feel as if they've got nothing, you know, got nowhere to go, yeah. and turn that into a thriving business. So. Yeah. You know, I think that's worth that's worth commenting Let's on. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. That's wonderful. No thank you. And well done. And you've got such a big challenge. You know, you've got so many staff that yeah. that, that you are responsible for. So, you know, keep yeah. up the great work. I will Eddie might give me a job. I can keep another few of them busy. <laughs> huh? Okay, thank you so much. Um, our next guest um, that we have here is is um, a money man. The figures. The one we really, really trust. The one that has the silver bullet. <laughs> Not. <laughs> um, oh, oh, hang on a second. Hang on a second. We've no, got a poll. For me. I, was getting I missed that. I've got, it's over your face, Dermot. Sorry, we've got a poll here now. Can everyone see that? Is there a difference between being engaged and being empowered? Yes, no, not sure. That's a really interesting question. So shall we give that? Um, one, one ends up in marriage, that. so there could be a slight difference there. Yeah, okay. We'd just like to know that for everyone that's joined us. Empowered and engaged. Easy one to mix up. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then we're going to have another question um, afterwards, and then then uh, then we're going to find out what, what the figures, what people really think about things. So welcome, Dermot. Um, my question to you really, uh, what I thought people would like to know is that you um, work a lot with um, self-employed, you know, uh, businesses that have a lot of self-employed people and there must be trends that you're seeing and not, notwithstanding the fact we've already got problems with, um, with Europe, you know, and so that's going to affect our ability to, to have people over from, from Europe, etc. And also with this COVID-19, um, where cash is king, but we have to be mindful of, of what we do with that and how we look after it. And I thought it would be quite nice if you shed a light on some trends you think might be having an effect on, um, on, on the construction industry at large. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, over the last number of, what, nine, ten weeks now, there's been a lot of changes, which I think anybody in, engaging ops, <clears throat> even outside construction, a lot of businesses have just gone to zero um, because they just have to shut. And quite a few have managed to keep going. I know Eddie is, is one the type of work he's working on. There's a, there's a few things for me. It, it's, this is all, we all know how strange it is, but it's kind of like a game where you're, say maybe you start off playing rugby. The whistle goes some stage during the game. The rules have changed and whoever's going to be the quickest to adapt to the new rules, make up the game and take it, to, to, to wherever it needs to go so it, it you know I, I did a quick in advance of this call I spoke to quite a few companies and those ones who managed to muddle through with their numbers largely intact um, the efforts they went to and their people they went to you know it, it's down to what the people did and you've got those companies who didn't cut wages and they were able to get keep going at, at, at any level even at director level and then you've got companies who, let's say like James, because you're on the form work side of things and you're working in maybe pairs, they've had to cut, and uh, maybe I think James is about 10%, but the industry on average in form work is about uh, up to 20%. So you're, you're kind of getting this, depending on who you're working for, they're unaffected at this stage. And then you've got people who are, um, who are deeply affected because cutting somebody's income, whatever level that by 40% is pretty savage. And I think, Diane, you have a slide there that I gave earlier to put up, which indicates essentially our numbers. You can see it was like during March, it was pretty much weekly, just tipping along. Then it dived a little and then it really dived. And then you can see a few weeks ago, um, three or four weeks ago, it's suddenly tipping up steadily. 
So that, that kind of reflects, I suppose, everybody would be somewhere on that with the flat at the top and the left being, but we weren't really affected, we worked through to right down to the bottom. Have we started back? Can we get back? And it, it, it really is, um, you know, quite stressful for people because there are people who do the work don't necessarily want to go to work. They're afraid to go to work. And if they have to travel to work, then they've got to be in an environment. So the whole thing is going to be, a, I feel, a massive shakeup as to how we're going to be interacting. It's like within three days, we, we all went working from home because of IT, but equally other businesses haven't. And then you've got the furloughing, which is masking the reality of unemployment, because there's a lot of people when they go back, won't be going back to a job. So it'd be great for the likes of Eddie and James and other companies, maybe Sam and Jacqueline, if, if they need people, they'll be able to get good people. Um, so look, yeah, winners and losers. Yes, thank you for that. I mean, that's a hard lesson, but you're absolutely right. Um, and, and also there is this, um, there is this notion, isn't it? The way we behave and the way people behave towards us will inform the way that we'll do business in the future. So the way you let your staff go will affect really whether or not they come back to you later on when you need them. You know, so our value sets are changing now. And, and um, I, I think this is something that perhaps um, uh, the, the management teams it would do them, serve them well to revisit their values because this is the new norm. It's not going to go away. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we're responsible. We're leaders, we, we hire people, but there are lives, aren't there, that are at stake and there are people's livelihoods. So yeah. maybe there's a big, bigger discussion about how do you keep those people mentally sane? Do they retrain? Do you retrain them? Are there positions within the business they can be trained for? I mean, there's, that's, a whole, that's a whole other session, but... Um, that, that seems to be something that I think people are worried about because you, you, know, you have to do the right thing to keep the business afloat. Well, mental health, all my staff are working from home. A lot of people's staff are still working from home or, or away. Um, I'm working with Diane actually next week to see if we can put something together for our staff and then maybe share with our clients if it can be useful. Because you want to get them back, you want to keep them going. We've got to keep positive. I mean, there's so many opportunities here. Even if you say, in the city, thousands of people aren't going to be going into the city to work half of them from home. Well, that's great. Once this settles down, you'll have half more office space for more businesses to locate a head office in the city, which is great. Or you might find we've got an excess of property for commercial that might end up coming residential. So the city becomes more of a natural, relaxed place that people want to live. So you can see a lot of, you know, a lot of great things are coming out of this. You know, a lot of people who've had downtime, they're able to think about their lives where they're going work more efficiently like people aren't having to get in their car go to meetings they can do a zoom call all that saves time and the quality of life which you know i know i'm starting to james on that um and that that's like there's a half an hour here an hour and a half there a day a few hours a day you've suddenly got you can do more do more things yes thank you for that and um and i think that really raises the question around ethics as well doesn't it really you know and um We'd like to think that with you know with extra time etc then we can um we can find different things for us to do and perhaps we need to weave that into our culture as businesses so that we can um put more resources to understanding this ebb and flow and being more helpful etc so but thank you for that dermot that that was wonderful thank you very much indeed um oh right okay so 94 percent of people said there was a difference between being engaged and being empowered only 60% no, but certainly, yeah. Well, that's an interesting, that's an interest. It would be quite nice to get some of these um, thoughts coming up through the chat. So thank you for that. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Dermot. Cheers, Anita. Okay. All right, then. So um, I think, I think um, the, the next speaker actually is, um, well, I'm really glad that she's here because um, she's gorgeous and glamorous and a woman. But, um, and one of the reasons I put um, this book, Work Like a Woman, I think that um, she's a wonderful leader, exponent, um, and I'd love her to just share 
what she brings to the party as a woman because I think because so many there's so many men in the construction industry there's so few women that take leadership roles but they bring something different and I'd asked everyone on your boards how many women have you got you know that'd be super thought you know um of, the, of your of your employees and if you're going into different areas of business could they make opportunities so without further ado Jacqueline welcome Right, okay. So when this thing happened, you know, everyone was looking at you, thinking, right, what is she gonna do next? Because if she can't hack it, then there's no hope for us. Um, so can you tell me what it was like, as soon as this hit you, we're talking about thinking we've got an empowered workforce. Of course we have, of course we have. But then the reality knocks, kicks in, doesn't it, when something like this happens. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, but before I start, Anita, I must um, state that I do think Eddie does champion women in the construction industry. Uh, I think he got a little bit of a bad uh, press oh, there. Oh, sorry, Eddie. I didn't mean it that way. You know I didn't mean it. In case it went the wrong way, Eddie does champion women in the construction industry. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I think the the speed at which the, the pandemic arrived, I think, took us all um, by surprise and shock. Um, what did I do? I reacted. I, I made the decisions I had to make. Um, I empowered my staff to make the decisions they needed to make. Um, we immediately had a management meeting to decide, right, what's the biggest issue? And for us being in the waste industry, um, Sam will be happy about this. Our biggest issue is fire. So we had to maintain uh, the levels of waste that were in the uh, transfer station. So that was our biggest uh, thought. We have a disaster recovery plan in place. Uh, the only thing that let us down was our phone system. So that kicked in and it worked uh, and would highly recommend everybody to, to have a disaster recovery plan. Um, obviously we didn't have one for a pandemic. We had one for a bomb, a flood, a fire, but um, it, it worked. So that was good. Um, I think it was very early on for me, it was, um, quite, quite obvious that mental health was going to be massive. Um, we've, we, we do an awful lot around mental health, addiction, that type of stuff, uh, in the construction industry it's four times uh, more likely that someone would, will commit suicide than uh, in the UK standards. But the uh, Chartered Institute of Builders said that 84% of stress in the construction industry was caused from lack of involvement in the decision making, which I think is a massive number. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, there is a difference with giving someone the option or or empowering them um, and I'm a firm believer in sharing the knowledge uh, as as many opportunities I can get to go out to tell people how I do it why I do it um, I'm there okay so would I be correct in in sort of uh, from what I can get from what you're saying is that it, it's it makes sense to have um, as part of your um, business strategy when you're looking at people and HR etc the, the, the concept of empowerment you have to have a strategy for that you have to be trained in that it doesn't not everyone feels they can be because they don't have the confidence so it, it's uh, people will be at a different level you know there's one thing making decisions but there's other things making decision, decision understanding what risk is um, but still making decision and feeling good about it and knowing they're working with, with the business that understand that if they get it wrong they're not going to have their, you know, they're not going to have their throats cut, but that that, but they can learn from their mistakes. So it's a culture change. Yeah, I think I, I think it is, and and I've got to say I think every single person can be empowered um, with the right coaching, uh, with the right tools. Um, you know, you can teach someone how to look at risk, what risk looks like. Uh, you can have the conversation with them um, that, okay, uh, I, I throw you out a scenario. What decision are you going to make? They make that decision. And then I say, well, why have you chose that decision, not this decision? And, and actually talk through with them why I agree or disagree and why I would have chose the opposite or why I would agree with them. And, and 
having that debate, and it is only a debate, and there's no harm in having debate, is, is absolutely massive. And I think everybody can be empowered. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't see why not. And I, and I do what I can to empower not only the staff, but anybody I meet in life, because why not? You know, my glass is on full. Absolutely, absolutely. And there are great people out there that will do um, training in, in empowerment, but also this, this whole idea of role reversal, because then, you know, if, if part of it is role reversal, then you, then you get to appreciate risk and, and you, you get to be in someone else's shoes. And the wonderful thing about empowerment, though, is if you have an empowered workforce, then they will, and it truly is, rather than just saying you're empowered, make the decision, but it's, it's more than just permission, isn't it? Oh, it is. You can see it in their body language. You know, they walk taller, their shoulders are back. Uh, they feel a, a sense of more importance. Um, they feel more involved. They're more productive. Um, you know, they'll go the extra mile for you because you've invested in them. They're going to invest in you, you and your business. Okay, okay. Now, can you tell us a little bit about what you think women bring to the party? What, do, what is it about women that that makes them a real asset if there's more of a balance um, go. particularly with regard to empowerment uh, and engagement etc cetera, etc cetera. as long as we don't have to go back to the bikini <laughs> <laughs> what do i think they bring um i think women look at things totally different i think women tend to weigh things up look at the pros and the cons um, and I think we can multitask uh, at a speed um, way quicker than uh, men can, and that's no disregards to men. I haven't burnt my bra or anything like that. I just think that's how our brains work. You know, we can do the washing, the cooking, look after the kids, do the ironing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I just think that that's what women bring, and I, and I also tend to find that women think outside the box, where. Um, men tend to think inside the box um, logically women you know and i'm not saying it's right all the time but sometimes it's nice to have that outside of the box thought yeah oh, yeah and i think we talk in, in with a different language now don't we empathy caring be kind you know they're not words in the business etiquette are they they're not the words in the business management manuals so our conversations our word the way we use our language needs to change as much as well doesn't it otherwise because it's through conversations, as you said, that people get a real feel for it. And, and also a lot of it's about common sense, isn't it? You know, It is, but I have to revert back to what James said. And no more than James, we were brought up with, you know, words, explicit words that I can't repeat here. Um, and it was a case of get it done. It needs to be done. Do it. Um, but yes, I do agree that we do have to um, speak differently now. Uh, whereas our dads would have just told us to go and do it. We now say, would you mind doing that, please? Um, there is no harm in it. I I've got to admit, it probably takes twice as long to get a job done because you have to build it up and, and fluff it up. But I think, I think as, as leaders, the staff then get to grips with what your style is. So my style... If I was sending somebody an email, I would always use please and thank you. I would never not use please and thank you. But I would never start it off with, oh, hi, how are you today? How was your weekend? Haven't got time for it. But I would ask them, would they please do X and let me know when it's done? Thanks. So, yeah, that, that, it, it, it's give and take. Okay, okay. And um, so looking back, what advice would you give to yourself now we are in the middle of the greatest single pandemic since World War II. That's a big um, question. Why didn't I marry a multi-millionaire when I was in my 20s and live in a, in a big mansion and not having this hassle? Um, what advice would I give myself? Uh, I wouldn't actually. Um, got to be honest, did feel the eyes on me at first. Felt like a goldfish in a bowl. Everybody was watching me. Um, I was getting phone calls from all sorts of people. I'm dealing with all types of anxiety from directors within the company to um, laborers. Uh, they all seem to be heading my way. I haven't got a problem with that. Can be quite a lonely place, uh, making all these decisions on yourself. Uh, the only thing that's failed me is my phone system, uh, which will be rectified ASAP. But 
yeah, I think I think on the whole, and in particular the construction industry, I think we've done a sterling job in the time we had, which was practically overnight. Yeah. So for you, it's like there's only one way that's up. Yeah. Only one way is up. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, I think we have another question, don't we, Guy? Aha! Have you ever asked people, your people, if they feel or think that they are empowered? Now that's very interesting because, you know, do we know what it even means? And so we're talking about language just, just now with Jacqueline. So that's quite an interesting question. Okay, so let's move on now. And our final guest, I'm just having a look at some questions here. Um, how will the panel react to social distancing in their offices? Will they look at doubling or trebling their floor space in a period of high commercial rental costs compounded by falling income? Or will they make home working a future fixed strategy, particularly as they, over 80% of staff are preferring to stay as it is? Mm, who'd like to take that question? Go on then, Jacqueline. Um, we uh, it couldn't actually have come at a worse time. We decided to refurbish our office just before the pandemic. And the idea was to give people smaller spaces because they, they tend to hoard more rubbish around them. So our office space or our desk space has halved over the pandemic. And it's now like, oops, what are we going to do? Um, people are very, very nervous about meeting people in the office, very nervous about visitors. We've already got salespeople coming back in the office, not sure why yet, but we, we have. Um, but I think as time goes on, I think people are gonna get calmer and the new norm is going to be stop bumping into each other, stop answering each other's phones and get on and stay in their own area. Okay, thank you for that, thank you. So my final, our final guest today is Sam Mallins. Where are you, Sam? Sam. Here I am, over there. You're here, muted. you're here, you're here. <laughs> the man with the yeah. beard, that's right, that's what I remember. And a great map of the world behind you. Welcome, Sam, it's brilliant to have you. Thank you. I'm Thanks. going to throw, uh, first of all, I'm gonna throw a little thing at you. You are a millennial. Oh, you said that to me yesterday. I know. The first time anyone said that to me. So but I looked up. And, yeah, I was 16 in year 2000, so I, I've got to take it. Um, and it's very, very important for us to understand how millennials think. Okay, because a lot of your workforce, there was, a, there was something on the radio I think yesterday saying that the, um, the big crisis is that those kids, 16 to 24, is going to be them getting jobs. There's a whole a big gap, a gaping gap for youngsters to get jobs. Um, and, and, you know, there's a whole, that generation really is going to find it quite hard, particularly after this. But there are a couple of things really. we talked about it just very, we touched on it briefly about the way millennials think that might be different to the way their parents have thought or the older generation. Um, and how you, and we talked very briefly about this integrating life work situation, and you'll be thinking and feeling and, and doing things that a lot of people will be thinking and doing it now, but they don't know how that's going to enrich their lives and how they're going to be empowered to be able to find work that allows them to be there for their kids when they have a bath or take the day off when they, you know, when, they, when they've got sports there or, or sitting down with their wives, their partners and thinking, well, actually the new normal and I'm really grateful for the things that I never, that I took for granted before. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of um, insight into how that works, how that looks or how that feels for you as, um, first of all, as a, a human being and then really the empathy you would have as a leader with, um, with, with how people feel about the new norm. Yeah, so I think as for me personally, um, pretty much like what James was saying earlier, you know, I've, I've grown up um, in business from a very young age and 
Um, it's all always, it's all, I've been on site, drove the diggers and come, come right the way, you know, come right the way th up through um, sort of on the labour inside. And I didn't, I've never really appreciated really appreciated really until the last couple of years about what you just said it was very much a case of you know let, let's work 12 hours a day let's finish late you know if, if, if people are going to work for me <laughs> they need to be similar um or and i think the last couple of years it's all it's all really changed so although um as you you know it, fairly young but I've, I've have got quite a, a, an older older school mindset but that's something that can't um you know, it, times are changing, as we've said, and it can't carry on. Um, there was, there's, a, there's a fantastic book I read end of last year um, called Outrageous Empowerment. And it's, what it, what it's really, what's really interesting, if you can um, relate very, very quickly to, is you look at Silicon Valley. Now, Silicon Valley is um, a whole, you know, a whole street of um, companies like, you know, Tesla and Apple, and, and they're all fighting for great people. Now, arguably, those great people could probably work for any of those businesses. They've got great minds. They've got great attitudes. And Outrageous Empowerment is all about understanding that and understanding how the best of those businesses um, keep and, and maintain a great workforce. Because, you know, we can think it's hard, you know, where we are. Um, but if you actually, you know, if you think about where they are and what they're trying to, trying to achieve in, you know, in one place, then obviously it's going to be extremely hard to, to keep keep people so going forward i think that's a massive uh, for us i think my opinion is i think the new norm will settle back into its own ways over over time that's just my opinion um i think jack is right in in um or, and, and you're right in what you're saying about people are gonna stop tripping over each other quite as much um we've we've been in the office for the majority, um, but very, very skeleton staff, mainly because I can't work from home. Um, but you, you see it, people are starting to kind of get a bit relaxed and we've got to, you've got to remind people that this is, uh, you know, this is a serious, uh, serious issue. So yeah, I think the, the new norm, I think will, um, will be interesting, but from, uh, from, from, from empowering the staff and again, it's empowering the staff to make a, to make the right choices around what's going on in in the world, we had a we had an issue on on site with one of our drivers this week that's obviously been working through, and he's he's been he's he's taken his foot off the pedal and he's walked up to someone on site and asked them a question and the site only went back on Monday, so you know they're like frightened and so it, I think it's very much a case of a, a, a regular repetitive message um, to empower people to do the right thing at the moment. So that's a cultural change, isn't it? That's sort of yeah. like we have to live that, don't we, every day. It's not something that happens and part of the training scheme. It's sort of this is our culture. This is embedded into our values now going forward. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So um, another thing we did talk about a little bit, and, I'd, and, and it's not, you know, it doesn't reel off the tongue very easily in this particular industry. But my question to you is how does it, empathy affect empowerment do you think i think it goes back to what um james touched on earlier i think empathy is understanding what that person's feeling at that time um and it's for me it does go back to that um sweep in the yard scenario there's two well there's multiple ways of asking someone to do it but as i said yesterday if you if you ask someone to just go and sweep the yard the no one's going to want to do it. But if you explain to them that, you know, that, that, that one of your best customers is turning up, this is the opportunity the company's going to have, this is what you may end up out of it, you know, and, and, and sell them the longer term dream, then they go from not wanting to, to actually, maybe not, maybe they're not going to run out the door with a broom, but they're actually a part of them is going to want to do that and want to do a good job for the business. So that I think is a big, a, a big part of, for me, that, that's what empathy and empowerment means. Um, I think what you, yeah, I think that's, um, that's what it means without going off track too much. No, no, that's, that's perfectly fine, that's great. I mean, I guess <coughs> empathy could be seen as, you know, walk a mile in my shoes. You know, then when you know what it's like for me, then we have empathy, don't we? 
you know, and I think that's a, that's a very, very strong driver for modern leaders to empathise with their people more. So they can really then it get is, the yeah. out of them, you know. Yeah. And, um, and yeah. it's, it's a bit like, yeah, I get it. I get it. I really do. You know, I really do. Um, we talked also a little bit about the processes that you might now put in place to help your structure work better for you in terms of empowering people. Have you given that any more thought at all? Yeah, we have. We've, we've put it, we've given it a lot of thought and um, we actually, just to, to give you a bit of background about how, how I, how I saw it was there's a, there's a guy, some of you will, will, will know or follow called Gary Vaynerchuk and he owns a, a large uh, multinational uh, media company and he's very, he, he's very, um, so he's, he's, he's heavily influencing on social at the moment. And he employed a chief heart officer. And the way, the way he put it was, as you grow through the business, and that's the same way as how I feel at the moment, um, in a way, we've got just under 120 people, um, four companies, and, um, and, we're, and it's only natural that we're, as we're in different locations, we've got two offices um, and, and, and three, if you, if, you, if you choose to site, it's hard to be in those locations. And as you get further away, you, as you, 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 I care deeply about the staff, but it's hard for them to understand and, and know that you do. So we're, we're looking at taking, or well, we are taking someone on. Um, we've agreed that she starts middle of next month, um, Tilly, and she's going to come on um, as a head of talent. And she's going to, what Gary called his, um, his lady Claude was the chief heart officer. I'm not quite sure we're going to, going to go down that route at the moment um, but I do like it and, it and it's about getting around all your staff and having that person having that contact and, and having someone it's probably I see it whether it's right or wrong as a number two to the board so should, so effectively you'll have um, myself Ed um, and Mark and then you'll, you'll have Tilly who will be directly underneath us and will actually over um, will, e will even sort of the, the, the rest of the directors and the, and the higher tier management will come into Tilly and then it will feed through to us. So we're, so we're as close as we possibly can be to, um, to the team. Because as I said yesterday, you know, I, I love going, I love going, you know, Firewood's a bit different. Firewood's, the, the, the engineers are all around the UK and we do a quarterly meeting with all the engineers. We choose somewhere like the JCB factory um, we did our local Rolls Royce garage. We used their um, we used their their boardroom. We set a meeting up, and they do half a day's training, or three quarters of a day's training, and a quarter of, of a bit of team bonding and looking around the place where we are. We did Duxford Museum, for example, um, and they're harder to get round. But one of the things I do love um, is walking on on site, maybe at, at the yard. And, and seeing seeing some of the guys that you know when I was there four or five years ago that are still there now is asking them how they are asking them you know how their manager is and asking them you know that kind of thing and you, you've got to filter the answers as we know but it's under but you know we do generally um, uh, you can there's a few things they say that you can pick up on and then you can come away and then you can start feeding through and finding out whether that's right wrong um, and, and, and just looking at whether there is a, a big opportunity to make the business better along the way. Thank you, thank you, that's excellent, thank you. I have a nice question here. Um, for the panellists, and I don't mind who takes this, how do the panellists intend to reach out to the next generation so they see construction as a career choice as Brexit will stem the flow of European tradespeople? And how does encouraging your teams to be empowered affect the bottom line? Who'd like to take that first part of the question? I how don't do mind giving a on. quick answer. Go, go. Um, for me, that's two things. It's communication and brand. Um, it's, quite, it's quite, you know, it, it, the brand is about people understanding the company and who they want to work for. And communication is the outward and it, it is the leadership. And I've put a bit of effort into it over the last few months. Sort of not, it's not my nature, but people have probably seen it on LinkedIn, doing a few um, videos and bits and pieces. And it's, it's about 
people wanting to work for the people that are lead, are leading the business and 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 the rest of the team um, within the business. So, but a big thing for me is brand. I think there was a um, something done recently, and it's quite surprising what companies people want to work for because of okay. the brand rather than the, the industry. Yeah, and um, a, a brand isn't a logo, and that's you know that's the truth of it, really. Um, yeah, that's. That goes. That feeds very, very well into my next point for the panel, actually, because it's all about values, isn't it? You, you, you work, you like your friendships, relationships, people that share your values. And my challenge to the panel is that when I was doing my research behind all of you, and I know you, you're all okay about me saying this, but there was nothing on the website. And don't forget, that's your shop window now that says we're a people place, that this is, these, are, these are our people. This is why they work with us. This is what they do. This is how they've made a difference with some, even some testimonials or some interviews on video, et cetera. And um, I think my challenge to you is that uh, talking about empowerment, uh, how do we communicate that and where do people touch it in your business isn't just gonna be when they're working with you. It's got yeah. to be this ongoing succession, new people coming in, um, and, and also the talent pool. You know, you've, got, you've only got access to a certain amount of people. And the, and the jobs, and also in this day and age, the jobs available within each construction-related firm are evolving and changing, you know. And so to have a lady like Tilly to come on board as your chief heart officer to look after your people, that would never have been a position perhaps 10 years ago in a business but now it is you know so um my challenge to all of you is that you're all fantastic and you, great employers and doing the right thing and and great leaders my challenge to you is how do you bring your values to life through the different channels that are available to you that are believable because we we're in a particular sector where it's about compliance deadlines budgets expertise, safety, and all of those things. But what makes you different and gives you a competitive edge is the quality of the people that work with you and the values that they really identify with. Um, would anyone like to take that? Anyone I'd, I'd, I'd just that? like to say about um, bringing new talent into the business, you know. Um, a lot of people I went to school with and, you know, people I was growing up with, we're told, you know, to get education, go university, get education. And it's drilled into, I think there was a whole generation there it was sort of drilled into. And um, the building, for certainly for, you know, we'll say English-born people, it wasn't an option. And I know, you know, lads can walk into my company as carpenters and earn 50 grand a year. And I know plenty with university degrees and they're not in anywhere near that sort of money, you know. I think... It just wasn't an attractive option, construction industry for people, but you can still earn very good money in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just don't think in schools at that level, I don't think it's pushed out there that, you know, quite, that it's, it is a good option. And it's a lot easier than what it was, you know? Yeah, the formwork we do, it's all systems now. You, you know, years ago, it was humping big, heavy, strong backs and, you know. So you need to shout it from the rooftop then, don't you? You absolutely. do, you, well, the whole industry yeah. does, but, you know. Tell your story, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a really great question just come in. I must uh, from um, uh, for one of our viewers. In my experience of working through recessions over the last three decades, sadly, empowerment takes a back step as decisions tend to become quite centric. Does the panel feel they will share the hard decisions with their teams okay. as often they will find ways to conserve costs? that they have not considered? What an excellent question. Who'd like to take that? <laughs> That's a good question. Jacqueline. Yeah, um, yeah, I will share with them. I think it's important that they know. I don't think that anybody's staff are um, silly enough not to realise that, you know, we don't know what's ahead. We don't know what next week's going to bring, let alone next month or six months' time. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important that everything is shared with them, uh, so they have a complete understanding. Fantastic. Anyone else like to pick that up? I don't think they So in our organisation, we, the senior management never put themselves in a position where they hijack decision making. 
I think it's important whilst that we have to have faith in the teams we have to take us out of that recession. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's fantastic. We're coming towards the sort of end of the session now, I think, Diane, aren't we? Yes, I think we are. Okay, so um, we're going to have some takeaways, but I want to leave you with some things that really resonate with me as a leader and also uh, with this, this whole concept of, of um, engagement and empowerment. So Stephen Covey, you probably all read this, if not, it's on your reading list, the author of Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Who's read that? Yeah, it's a great book to read, okay. So what I found very powerful was that he said, seek first to understand, then be understood. That is so powerful because that can be applied to every single person in your company, whether they are the man in the digger, the one doing the footings, the one laying the tarmac, the middle management, the senior team. So seek first to understand, walk a mile in their shoes, show some empathy, then to be understood. And the next one, I love this. So Richard Branson, do we know who he is? He said, train people well enough so they can leave, treat them well enough so they don't want to. I think that's stunning, don't you? Anyway, they're two of my thoughts. But um, I just want to say, wow, what a great session this has been. Such wisdom in this room here and wonderful ages and, and, and you know, um, got a girl, that's great. Two of us, fantastic, and the team. So wonderful. Thank you so much for being so open and for sharing your, your thoughts because I think that's going to resonate really, really you know resonates so much with all the people that have come come in and and I hope there'll be some questions that people will keep be thinking about and keep sending them in um, uh, to to bitter because and then feeding them out to yourselves um, I'd like I'd like Laura to step up really now and then perhaps give us or Paul have a you know what are the takeaways do we think that we can take away from today Paul perhaps it's it's over to you well, the firstly, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to balance everything and say, boys, it's great to be boys, you know? <laughs> well done, um, fantastic. Well done. We haven't um, got assets like us. <laughs> the other takeaways, I mean, one of the major takeaways from this is this is a leadership panel um, that has been together now over the last few weeks. And one thing for sure is um, consideration is a great takeaway. I think a lot of people, the conversations we're having um, are full of calm. And I think um, the you know, consideration is there. I think patience and calm has been part of the solidarity within the community of BITA in particular. And in these times, we need those values. We need those qualities. You know, We need to be brave in terms of giving people a, a chance to learn, take risks, in that decision making process you know and one thing that that you know all of these people and all these panelists on the panel have shown in terms of values is their support to the organization to each other to the industry as a community because this is what is going to get us out of um, this terrible time and one thing that i've taken from this is that sense of calm that we are actually now out of the mire of we'd say the you know crisis management stage and we're sitting back and thinking and we're considering and we're actually finding our way out and navigating our way out of this. And, and that for me um, makes me actually wanting to say, well done, boys and girls. Uh, and, and, and it gives me solace um, that we actually have found a way already and, and we will move forward um, from these terrible times and adapt. So um, empowerment is a major, major part of that. So I suppose that in, initially or essentially is, is my takeaway. Um, I'd like to thank you, Anita, for doing a wonderful job in moderating. Um, before we go, um, the poll results uh, are very interesting as well. Have you ever asked people if they feel they think they are being empowered? That was a 50-50. So there goes, you know, to show that the understanding of empowerment and engagement is very, very important, you know? So thank you all for the panelists, Eddie, uh, James, Sam, uh, Jacqueline, and Dermot O'Grady, and we look forward to seeing you all again um, on the Bitter platform very soon.